the Congo, one of the largest and richest countries on the continent. The Belgian colony was demanding immediate independence. Patrice Lumumba, the young articulate clerk, led the movement that negotiated a peaceful solution to end Belgian rule. On June 30th, 1960, King Baudouin arrived in Leopoldville, the capital named after his great uncle, to hand over power. Le roi Baudouin était dans une voiture découverte. Il saluait la foule, etc. Un Congolais s'est précipité sur la voiture. J'ai vu les, les gardes du roi dégainer. Tout le monde avait peur, se disait, il va tuer le roi. Non, il a simplement sorti l'épée du roi de sa gueule. Et il s'est mis à danser avec cette épée. Euh, C'est très symbolique, ça. C'est comme s'il lui a arraché le pouvoir. On Independence Day, all the dignitaries assembled in Parliament. King Baudouin was to announce the transfer of power to the new government. Patrice Lumumba had just been elected prime minister. But the euphoria of independence did not last long. That same day, Lumumba lit a fire that spread through the entire continent. L'indépendance du Congo constitue l'aboutissement de l'œuvre conçue par le génie du roi Léopold II. Le discours du roi Baudouin, qui nous rappelait comment la Belgique nous a sortis de, de l'esclavage, comment ils ont lutté pour nous sortir des maladies du sommeil et patati patata. Ça a été un choc. Nous ne nous attendions pas à ce rappel malheureux parce que nous estimions que le roi Baudouin n'avait plus de leçons à nous faire hein, ce jour-là. À ce moment-là, le monde a Il n'était pas programmé comme devant parler à ce moment-là. Il se lève et il parle. Il fait un discours très militant. Combattant de l'indépendance, aujourd'hui victorieux, je vous salue au nom du gouvernement congolais. Nous avons connu les ironies, les insultes, les coups que nous devions subir au matin, midi et soir, parce que nous étions des nerfs. Rappelez-vous comment on traitait le blanc par rapport au noir. Rappelez-vous dans les écoles quelle place nous occupions. Rappelez-vous tout l'apartheid. Alors évidemment, réaction immédiate de toute la délégation. Mais d'abord, beaucoup d'agitation pendant que le monde parle. Qui oubliera en fait les fusillades ou périr tant de nos frères, ceux qui ne voulaient plus se soumettre au régime d'injustice, d'oppression et d'exploitation C'était mal reçu par les Belges, mais nous, nous avons tout à fait répondu à nos, à nos aspirations. Et au moment du dîner, on demande à Lubumba de présenter des excuses. Il ne s'en fait pas. Il présente des excuses en disant « Je pensais que je devais dire à cet homme des choses, je les ai dites, donc si ça a blessé, je m'en excuse et je demande qu'on tourne la page et que... » Nous pouvions voir les choses autrement. Mais il était trop tard. La majesté était lésée. Et la majesté les a décidés le soir même de se venger. Et tout a commencé. Lumumba wanted to govern independently. But there were only 30 university graduates in the Congo. So it was agreed that for the next five years, Belgium would continue to run the important departments of the new state, including the army. The soldiers felt excluded from the newly acquired freedom. Within days, they started a mutiny, which led to the breakdown of the entire country. The troops were roaming the streets, all armed. And uh, it, was, it was quite a racial problem. The mutineers were there, and they had uh, matiti, that's you know, bushes on their helmet, which was a sign that they were prepared for action. 
for combat. And I can remember one yelling, you know, venez, venez, sal flamand. We were all dirty Flemish. That was some, some an expression that, that meant you were really bad and uh, we're going to kill you. More and more stories circulated about killing, rape, pillage, etc. It was, if you will, the Iraq of today. Le 10 juillet, le 10 juillet, retenez bien la date. Les militaires belges ont occupé l'aéroport de Njili ici. Ils ont organisé l'agression du Congo en disant puisque les militaires congolais mutinés se sont attaqués aux femmes, aux enfants et aux officiers, la Belgique n'avait plus aucun autre moyen de protéger ses ressortissants que de faire venir des troupes belges le 10 juillet. Dix jours après. Le Mumba immédiatement tourne to the US for support. The United States had never been a colonizing power, and their democratic principles seemed to guarantee support for people fighting for independence. Fidel Castro himself had chosen the U.S. as his first stop for support when his revolution triumphed a year earlier. But like Castro, Lumumba's attitude did not go down well with the Americans. I was in the lobby of the embassy when this little Congolese clerk came in and he said he wanted 24 visas. He didn't know what a visa was. I said, well, do you have passports to put the visas in? Ah, no, patron, he didn't. So I, I explained to him what a visa was. And I said, why do you need 24? Well, he said, uh, Lumumba is going to the States to see President Eisenhower. I said, oh, that's interesting. Told him ambassador. He said, I'm not aware of it. So he checked and Eisenhower said, well, if he comes, I'll, I'll be here. Lumumba couldn't have made a worse impression on the Secretary of State and his deputy and other people with whom he met there. He threatened, he asked for things, uh, including to have a woman sent around to his room. The visit was not a success, and it was clear that Washington would not come to his rescue. Just as Lumumba was leaving Washington, Cuba announced the nationalization of U.S. companies and a trade embargo was immediately imposed on the island. Lumumba, like Castro, soon discovered that the Soviet Union was more than happy to help where the U.S. would not. At this moment, Lumumba commits probably the second error. He takes the decision and makes a telegram addressed to Khrushchev to ask him to send the Soviet Union troops to come and shoot the Belgians. This telegram, before he came out, was stolen by the Secretary of Lumumba by his Secretary of Lumumba by his Secretary of the Cabinet of the Cabinet qui s'appelait Candolo Damien. Larry Devlin s'accapare du télégramme, les transmet au gouvernement américain. We, we became aware of it almost immediately. And it came from uh, Congolese sources. Uh, that immediately alerted the Americans. I became wide-eyed at that. I said, ah, we have a problem here. He tried to play off the West against the East. Uh, it's an old game, but was relatively new at that time in Africa. But Larry Devlin l'a pas pris comme ça. Il a pris pour dire voilà la preuve est là que le monde communiste n'est pas conséquent. Outre le fait qu'il a insulté le roi des Belges, il est communiste donc il faut le chasser du pouvoir. The Congo crisis was becoming more than just a local conflict in faraway Africa. The superpowers were taking a particular interest, especially Moscow, that had recently set up a bureau for aiding anti-colonial liberation movements. 
the Soviet Union was eager to help, or at least agreed to help, the legally elected Congolese government. It was in the last days of July when a squadron of our Illusion 14 transport planes, about 10 left for Leopoldville. By the way, they landed in Athens, and the airport, which was partly NATO base, it became a big noise. The whole noise about the Cold War started when we landed then. It was the first time that there'd ever been Soviets in that part of Africa, at least certainly not in the Congo, and very few in the rest of Africa because the colonial powers were not desirous of having the Soviets there. Третий мир в этой войне был полем, так сказать, для охоты. Перевели вам? Полем для охоты. Почему? В Европе границы были забетонированы. Перейти границу означало начать атомную войну, которую никто не хотел. А третий мир, он был как будто без хозяина. Там была возможна свободная охота. Там можно было приобретать влияние. We believed, and I think it's true, that it was attempt to hold Congo as a base, especially as a base of minerals for the United States, for the West. You should not forget that the first atomic bomb was done of those uranium found in Congo. There were only two countries in the world that supplied cobalt at that time, Soviet Union and the Congo. And cobalt is extremely important for jet engines and all sorts of high technology. And we could not get it from the Soviet Union because it was a security commodity. So Congo was our only source. I suspect that the people in Washington began wondering where are we going to get our cobalt from if, if uh, the Soviets managed to control that. The United States deplores the unilateral action of the Soviet Union in supplying aircraft and other equipment for military purposes to the Congo. The Soviet action which seems to be motivated entirely by the Soviet Union's political designs in Africa. I must repeat that the United States takes a most serious view of this action by the Soviet Union. Eisenhower fumed about aggressive Soviet support for his opponents. Soviet military aid for Lumumba arrived in the Congo only one month after the first Soviet arms shipment had landed in Cuba. To make matters worse, Castro openly declared that he intended to use these weapons to export his revolution. Eisenhower decided to send the CIA into action. I received a message saying that uh, people were in Washington were highly concerned about the activities of the prime minister and that uh, they hoped that he would go, you know, to a it would be a change in the government. The next thing I knew, I received a cable saying that someone by the name of Joe would arrive in Leopoldville and I was to take my instructions from him. And the instructions were that I was to remove him physically from, <laughs> in other words, assassinate the uh, moment. I asked first, whose instructions are these? And he said, they've come from President Eisenhower. The president wanted this done, and I, and I was to put together these poisons and bring them out to you. One of the poisons was a tube of toothpaste that had a poison in it. So that if he brushed his teeth with it, that was been the end of the man. All of these things I put in my safe because I didn't want them lying around the office. If somebody may say, oh, may I use your toothpaste? <laughs> I felt that I had some pretty good operations going, and in the long term, my operations would achieve the objective of removing Lumumba from office, but not killing him. The Congo plunged into utter chaos. In the confusion, two separate secession movements broke away from Lumumba's government. The country desperately needed to be brought under control. 
the United States started to worry about it because the Soviets were backing Lumumba. So President Eisenhower said, well, we may have to use NATO there to keep the Soviets out. But finally, uh, cooler heads prevailed and they asked the UN Security Council to send a peacekeeping operation to the Congo. President Eisenhower made some very basic policies which are still in existence today. And he said that if there are troubles in Africa, we don't want to have to send troops there. Well, Europeans should not send troops. It should all be done by the UN. Lumumba thought that the arrival of the UN peacekeepers would help him bring stability. He was wrong. The UN mission provided the missing ingredient to oust his government. Lumumba had just promoted his personal secretary, Joseph Mobutu, to Army Chief of Staff. Mobutu was to coordinate with the UN troops to stop the country's descent into anarchy. Instead, he turned to Larry Devlin. Mobutu said that the army was very unhappy with the prime minister because he was turning the army over to the Soviets. He wanted to mount a coup d'etat, but there was one condition. They had to know that they would have the support of the United States government. I had tried and failed to achieve by it legal means what they wanted the united states government wanted so i stood up and shook his hand finally it took me a while to do this and said i guarantee you the support of the united states government and uh, the coup de, he said the coup will take place within a week and it did u.n troops were supposed to protect the independence of congo but they would not allow the Congolese troops, which were loyal to Lumumba, to operate. The mission of the United Nations troops was misused to topple the regime of the government of Lumumba, or at least not to protect Lumumba. The troops of the Nations Unies will be the residence of the Premier Minister. Without any mandate, without any authorization, there is a crisis internal. The Nations Unies interposes et vont mettre le premier ministre en résidence surveillée. Lumumba's supporters organized his escape. He was sneaked out of his house, bundled up in the back of a government car. Le ministère de Pense Lumumba était parti de chez lui, on a commencé à le chercher. Mobutu a demandé aux Nations Unies de lui donner des hélicoptères, on l'a poursuivi, on l'a arrêté. On les a mis dans un hélicoptère. On l'a ramené ici ligoté comme un vulgaire bandit. On Mobutu's orders, Patrice Lumumba was sent to his death. It was barely six months since Congo celebrated independence. C'est terrible. Vous enlevez celui qui est le flambeau, l'icône, tout d'un coup, comme ça, et, et d'une façon très barbare, en utilisant les mains africaines. Alors c'était frustrant, c'était écœurant, c'était un appel à l'insurrection populaire. Il faut venger cela. Ce pays est à nous et je vais me battre pour lui. C'est elle étincelle qui m'a fait conduire sur le chemin du maquis, de la guérilla. A witch hunt tracking down Lumumba's followers started in the capital. One by one, the Lumumbas fled to the safe haven across the river in Brazzaville. They organized themselves into an armed rebellion led by the 23-year-old Laurent Kabila. Lumumba's assassination resonated throughout the world. The shock was felt clearly in Cuba, where a large percentage of the population traces its origins back to the Congo. Cuba's young revolutionary leaders were appalled. 
the island declared a three-day official mourning in honor of Lumumba's memory. Matt said, it said, he said, Mabuda want to see you at 8 o'clock bus time. I said, who wanted to see me? He says, the president. That was all I needed to know. I had two choices. If I laid there, I'd be out by the seat. Shit. <laughs> Well, six guys said it was two kids at four, and you're the only. Okay, uh, what are you writing? Get ASA what? Sixty-four. Okay, and I, I shoot ASA a hundred with the uh, CPS. Yeah, right, right. Because you know me, I line up. Listen, do you want me to line up the shop for you as well, Harry? Unbelievable. Gentlemen, please, would you step back this way? Well, let's try it this way. Gentlemen of the press, please. Someone please tell us where are they going to stand? Then we can make our little group and you can have it all around. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Bon, allez-y, allez-y. Dites-leur ce qui va se passer. Gentlemen, the president is going to walk down the walk and he's going to come back and stand there. The primary purpose of this is to create a television tape for the telecast on Wednesday morning. And therefore, I would appreciate all the photographers if you want to form one line. Il, il demande à tous les journalistes de se mettre de côté parce que le président a passé par un hôpital qui est juste en face de vous. Et alors, l'essentiel, c'est que la grande caméra qui est là pour prendre des belles images. Alors, vous pouvez vous mettre en ligne tous. Le président va, va, va se mettre juste en face du fleuve. Comme ça, vous avez l'occasion de photographier. All right, he's going to stand right over there. Right. right. Bon, d'accord, okay. écoutez. Okay. Alors, je vais demander à ces gens de reculer ici. OK. Reculer ici, monsieur. Move backwards. Ça fait presque 100 hectares. 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 Je ne suis pas pour le palais. Le palais, c'est not, he's not for a palace, but his palace, that's small house. Mm -hmm. Palace. Place where he does all
And we feel more free, more at home here than we do in the United States itself. Watching what you all do here in Zaire, watching you progress and be independent will make us more confident when we preach unity and independence to our people in America. Africa is a continent that has been a chamber of horrors for decades. It's really not the fault of the African people. It's largely a result of the kind of system that's been perpetuated there. You have these oligarchs which dominate these countries that oftentimes have natural resources that can be very lucrative. And these oligarchs strike deals with foreign corporations or foreign governments who in effect prop them up and put them in power. And in exchange, these oligarchs give these entities access to rich mineral deposits. And the Clintons, you would expect to be opposed to this sort of thing. And that's at least what their language does. Our countries have deepened our cooperation on many issues, including good governance and transparency, energy, regional security, and advancing peace and development in the Niger Delta. The problem is their words are different from their actions. The fact of the matter is Paul Kagame has a terrible human rights record. He's accused of aiding military operations in the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo, and that actually forced the recruitment of child soldiers. The UN has identified him as being involved in activities that entailed massive human rights violations. The newer opposition parties that have been formed in the last year or two have one by one been silenced or otherwise excluded from the race. And individuals, not only politicians, but even journalists, for example, and other Rwandans who may have views different from those of the government, have found themselves at the receiving end of what has become quite a violent campaign of intimidation. Well, Paul Kagame is a friend of Bill Clinton's. I want to say a special word of appreciation for the leadership of President Kagame. I'm greatly humbled uh, to receive this Clinton Global Citizen Award. He's actually given awards by Bill Clinton for his conduct as the leader of that country, and they regale him as a great military leader. This is the sort of legitimization that we don't want of these kinds of dictators and leaders. That's the kind of legitimization that the Clintons have engaged in and they've done it in a way that creates commercial opportunities for donors and friends and allies who want to do business in Africa.
Business in Africa means you're dealing with dictators who are going to give you access to, say, mineral rights or oil drilling rights, but you're going to have to pay them off. The Clintons partner with foreign entities who want access to Africa, and specifically mining companies or energy companies who need to get concessions for access to oil or natural gas or the rights to mine for gold. Those two make a powerful alliance because these companies will give money to the Clintons, either in the form of speaking fees or in the form of donations to the Clinton Foundation. And the Clintons will then, in effect, do their bidding before the halls of power and corridors of power in Africa. And they will go to foreign governments and encourage them to do business with individuals who are putting money in their pocket. And this leads to some amazing fits of behavior that, in a way, are just reminiscent of 19th century colonialism. A perfect example of this is Ambassador Joe Wilson. Joe Wilson is a longtime friend of the Clintons. In fact, he endorsed Hillary Clinton in the 2008 presidential election. And it was also thought that he might become a senior official in Hillary Clinton's State Department. But the fact of the matter is Joe Wilson was up to something far more nefarious during Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State. In 2009, shortly after she became Secretary of State, when Wilson was the vice chairman of a company called Jarge Capital, they took out a 50-year lease on 400,000 hectares in South Sudan. South Sudan was in the middle of a civil war, and this lease was actually signed with warlords who were involved in the civil war. These individuals who were engaged in massive human rights violations, including the massacre of opponent tribes. And basically what Joe Wilson was engaged in was something called investing in sovereignty changes. They were basically cutting deals, lucrative deals, worth potentially hundreds of millions of dollars with these warlords. And the expectation was simple. These warlords would take power, then they would give them access to these lands where they could make huge amounts of money exploring for natural gas, exploring for oil, and for mineral rights. Ambassador Joe Wilson isn't the only Clinton friend and foundation donor who was working in war-torn countries. Swedish mining investor Lucas Lundin has pledged $100 million to the Clinton Foundation. He did that in 2007. And his most lucrative mining operations are in the war-torn country of the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is a country that perhaps has the most horrific human rights situation on the face of the earth. By the time Lucas Lundin made his $100 million pledge to the Clinton Foundation, his Congo operation was making, quote, staggering profits, end quote, according to his own financial statements. His overall capitalization was $20 billion. But for those profits to remain staggering, U.S. policy under Hillary Clinton had to remain unchanged. That's a problem. Hillary Clinton, as a senator back in 2006, supported something called the Congo Relief, Security, and Democracy Promotion Act. As the law's name implied, the goal was to bring reform to Congo. That's not something that Lucas Lundin would want. So in 2009, when Hillary became Secretary of State, she reversed course 180 degrees and went from supporting reform in Congo to supporting the status quo, which is exactly what Lucas Lundin would want who of course had committed $100 million to the Clinton Foundation. But Congo isn't the only scandal-plagued country where Clinton benefactors have made millions. 